Nope, it's not advanced. Stuck. Okay, just click. Okay, um, so this the um, up in Muskogee Bay, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, just has the most amazing views, and um, this is from I believe uh, Harbor Island, uh, and then this is a view of Hog Island. Some different shots of Hog Island. Um, we had beautiful week. Uh, it started out rainy, but the fog cleared and we had just um, beautiful uh, time up there. Uh, the staff is absolutely incredible. This is Todd Gilman um, from Connecticut Audubon. And this is the whole staff. Kevin was the director of the camp. Uh, Kayla um, did some work on mindfulness. Amanda, Eva, the camp director. Um, I'm forgetting names. Juliet um, did some of the workshops as well. Todd Gilman, Mar Margaret, and then Eric, um, who is also the caretaker of the island. Uh, they put together just an amazing week of programs. Uh, we took classes um, that were offered on all kinds of different things from art to um, uh, mindfulness, uh, nature journaling. I took a lot of the classes on science, being a science teacher. So we had a, a walk about the coastal geology of the island, um, ornithology as well. Uh, we did a went back to the mainland briefly for a pond study and how to um, bring pond life uh, live for kids. Um, even in city areas, we talked about, you know, uh, ways of incorporating that type of learning. At night, we had an evening entomology. Uh, there were people from Immaculata College that were doing research for Audubon. They were actually helping document all the species and um, to update Hog Island in order to bring it online, all of their resources online. So in exchange for that, the people, um, one professor and a couple of his undergrads were able to spend a couple weeks out on the island and we benefited from them being there as well. And um, it wasn't all learning. We had some fun as well. Uh, on one of the first evenings, we had s'mores on the shore. Uh, we had a little campfire on the beach and got to uh, roast some marshmallows. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, we did a walk around Hog Island. Uh, I, we did the longer walk, uh, which was five miles all around the island uh, to the far end. And it covered all kinds of different ecosystems. Um, the, what was really interesting was at the end of the island was what they called the shell middens. And the, these were piles of shells that were left from centuries of Native Americans. And it completely changed the ecology of the end of the island to where um, milkweed could grow. And it became, it's an area where they see a lot of monarchs. Um, and it kept the pine forest at bay, uh, the spruce forest. Uh, we also did some exploring at the beaches and um, in the tide pools and that. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, we did some bird watching. Uh, and this is actually the spot that I went back to later in the week to get this next shot. There was a juvenile Merlin falcon that we could hear. And I was determined before I left that I would get it. And it showed up, it hung out on the branch and I got this shot. Uh, on a burst shot it as it took off so I was so excited I was like okay my week's complete I got the Merlin Falcon um the food was absolutely amazing uh, a lot of it locally sourced um we finished with a lobster dinner on the last night um but even the paella and some of the other um fixings that Carter the chef made were absolutely astounding and went, never went hungry. <laughs> Everything was delicious. Um, met a lot of different teachers, made a lot of friends. We had a lot of fun um, exploring and um, sharing interests. Some of the teachers, you know, everyone had something to share. Uh, as a marine biologist, I was kind of the resident expert on tide pools, but other people knew mushrooms and mycology. Other people knew herbs and were pointing out different plants as we explored places. So it was, it was fun for all and um, we learned a ton of information. 
Um, the highlight was the boat trip to Egg Rock. Um, Egg Rock is where 50 years ago, Steve Kress started the um, seabird program to restore puffins and terns nesting on the island. And it is a phenomenal success story. And we got to go out to Egg Rock. And this is actually an Audubon um, observer on the island who is looking at birds coming back to their nests and seeing which ones are feeding. Uh, so this was a really cool shot. I love the fact that I could actually see the person on the island. Um, and there were all kinds of gulls and terns, and it was almost overwhelming, the noise coming from all the different birds that were there. And um, this was a greater shearwater um, that we were fortunate to spot. Um, and of course, some puffins and a cormorant drying its wings and more puffins. And of course, puffins, <laughs> which is why everyone loves going out to Egg Rock. Um, and it was just a phenomenal week. Uh, I learned a lot about different um, aspects of outdoor education, and it was really inspirational to learn from these other teachers as well, to see people at the beginning of their career and the end of their career um, coming together to learn more, um, to share our knowledge, and to then take it back to the people that we work with. And, and some of the teachers you know, were elementary, others um, taught all ages, as um, Ted Gilman uh, said from pre-K to gray. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, you know, to be able to, you know, bring this interest to my students and at um, Wells Junior High, I'm trying to get a young birders club going. Um, I have a couple students from last year that are interested as soon as they get done with the play this week. And um, another couple of new students um, coming aboard. So I'm hoping to be able to do things with them and get them excited about birds as well. And as we left the island, uh, you know, we bid adieu to uh, Hog Island. Everyone was kind of disappointed that we had to leave, but we found out that they have a volunteer program that uh, if you're the friends of Hog Island, you can apply to return as a visitor. So I might be uh, returning next summer as a volunteer if I can. Um, and I want to thank especially York County Audubon um, for sponsoring me um, so that I could uh, make a dream come true and uh, just really enjoyed uh, my whole week there. So. Thank you so much, Christine. That was wonderful. Great. Did you take the pictures? Are those? Uh -huh. Yeah, they were lovely shots, lovely shots. So thank you. And on to our main program for this evening. Uh, IVN and Maisie Murs are two doctoral candidates at UMO and have been working for several years on small mammals. And we're delighted to have Ivy here with us tonight to share with us her, uh, the work she's been doing and uh, fascinating stuff about small mammals in the forest. All right, cool. All right, um, this is a great crowd. I'm really excited to be sharing some of our research here today. So I just wanted to check that everyone can hear me in the back of the room. And then I'm sure everyone can hear me on Zoom. Perfect, okay. Um, so this is one of the first times that I'm gonna be talking to um, people that aren't within my specific department. So if there's any point in here where you're like, that is a word you haven't used before and I don't know what that word means, please explain, just stop me and I'd be more than happy to pause and explain myself so that you guys are on the same page with me. Um, so I, as um, Bill so warmly welcomed me, am a PhD student at the University of Maine. I'm in the wildlife department and my advisor, uh, 
Dr. Alessio Mortaliti is um, the head of this entire project and really like the big wig. Um, and Maisie is one of my, uh, I guess my lab mates is what we call each other. And we work on very, very similar things. And so one of the big goals that I wanted to, I guess, aim for during this presentation is to convince you that what we're doing is important. And and then I, as soon as I came in, I was like, actually, this is probably not the crowd that I need to convince, but maybe this is the crowd that I can get a little bit more excited about what it is we're doing and to show you, you know, small mammals are cool, but maybe they're cooler than birds. I don't know. We'll see at the end of this. Okay, so the first question that I really wanted to ask you guys first is to think back, um, Christine, this is a perfect time for you. And if you were to ask your your high school, your middle school biology students, like how does a forest come to be? Then let's say we take out a whiteboard and you start writing out characteristics on there. Maybe you'd say, oh, uh, the local geography, it's, you know, this kind of seasonality that's happening there. That's going to determine what kinds of things are going to live in the forest. Think about soil characteristics, precipitation, all these kinds of things. But these factors aren't explaining how they got there in the first place. So how do they move there? As far as I know, trees don't have legs. Um, they can probably spread out a little bit, but how did they get there in the first place? And so this is one of the biggest questions um, that we look at is seed dispersal. So how do plants move? How do they get to where they need to go? Because one of the biggest things um, for a plant in their lifetime is this uh, single opportunity in their life for them to be able to move farther away, for them to find and colonize a new place, for them to spread out their genes, all these wonderful things. And so plants, as you would imagine then, have evolved a whole host of strategies in order to move. So up here on the left are some maple seeds. They've evolved wings so that they can stay airborne, they can stay aloft for a lot longer, they can move farther. Other seeds are ballistic. These seed pods have like evolved this like, tension and pressure within the seed pod so that as soon as some kind of small stimuli hits them, in this case, this one's falling on the ground, they can move farther. I'm, I don't know if anyone's heard of the sandbox tree, but that one can spit out seeds like as far as, a, as the length of a football field. So it's kind of amazing. And obviously you can tell how important these are. Burrs, I'm sure you've gotten some this fall as you're walking through the forest. You're like, oh, I'm accidentally helping this plant disperse its seeds. But that was a strategy in the, in, from the first place. Um, but one of the most important evolved strategies are seed producing plants that rely on animals and birds to eat their seeds and then to take them farther away. And in fact, it's estimated that approximately 50 to 90% of all seed producing plants rely on animals to disperse their seeds. So one of the most important uh, animal dispersers are small mammals. And hopefully that's why you're here for this talk is because you also think they're very important for uh, forest ecology. Um, so this is animals such as squirrels, chipmunks, mice, and voles. No doubt you've seen chipmunks in your yard stuffing their cheek pouches full of bird seeds that you just put out in the birdhouse. Or maybe you've seen viral videos of acorns pouring out of the houses of um, someone's wall of these acorn stashes of these red squirrels. So no doubt, you know, you can see that they're very important seed dispersers and seed predators. They can handle thousands of seeds in a given season. And we also know that in certain places, a preferred seed could be harvested up to 95% just by small mammals. So they're pretty, pretty insane. Um, so they can play this role simultaneously. Uh, but it's a really interesting dilemma then for the plant because the seed needs to entice the animal enough that they're like, oh, this is something valuable that I'm going to take and eat, but maybe not so much that they're going to eat them right away. And so to prove this point, seeds have evolved various defenses like hard shells and bitterness and early germination so that they can escape predation from these small mammals. And so it's a really delicate balance, but it's something that's really important to study for to understand what this relationship is between animals and plants. Ah, oh, this is my favorite graphic that I made, but I missed it. But anyway, so <laughs> what this is saying is that if you are a seed disperser, you're going to be a positive effect 
on a plant. But if you're a seed predator, you're going to be antagonistic. So negative, positive, they're somewhere on the spectrum. Which side are they on? What's their relationship? And so it'll be these combined actions of these small mammals that are going to, going to decide what the composition of the seed bank is going to be, forest uh, germination rates, and then regeneration rates, and then what is the future composition of our forests going to look like. So before I get too much farther, I'm going to try to help us all get into the mind of a small mammal uh, with a very seasonal analogy. So if you think back um, to when you were in primary school, you have the perfect costume ready, you're ready to go this weekend, you've got your bag, it's nice and empty, and you're sitting down and you're trying to strategize where and what houses am I going to get to? So you're obviously going to avoid the dentist's house because toothpaste has no nutritional value. You're not going to go there. Uh, your neighbor's house, they always give out milk does and you just got your braces in. So maybe you're not going to go to that house either. Your best friend's house, they always have king size candy bars. So they're like amazing, right? But their decorations are always a little bit too realistic. They're kind of scary. You're a little bit of a, of a, you know, a scaredy cat. So maybe you're not going to go there after all. And so the point of this analogy is that small mammals are very much kind of in the same mindset, especially during the fall, where they're really racing against time to be able to forage and get enough food to survive their winter. And so they're balancing costs and risks in order for them to, you know, take advantage of these resource patches. So if I extend this even more, and maybe this is too much, but I'm just so excited because it's Halloween soon. So after a hard night's work, you sit down on your bedroom floor, you pour out all of your candy and you're looking at your candy and you're trying to strategize, okay, how am I going to protect this stash of candy? And, you know, there's candy predators all in the house. You've got three different siblings and one of them loves the same kinds of candy you like. You also have parents and they also love candy, even though they say it's not good for you. You know, they sneak from your stash too. So what are you going to do? Are you going to try to hide? them in maybe your dress drawer your dresser or maybe you're going to put them all in your backpack because nobody looks in your backpack or you know maybe you should keep them all together so that you can defend them and so these are the kinds of things that small mammals are also thinking about um, and also things that they have to contend with what are they going to prioritize where are they going to put the things that they so you know worked so hard to collect and how are they going to defend them um, and so Bringing this back into the small mammal world now, there are typically two different kinds of hoarding strategies. There are your larder hoards and your scatter hoarders. And your larder hoarders are those ones that put all of their candy in one basket. So that is like the American red squirrel. Um, just like Christine was saying earlier, those, that was amazing. The, it was the oyster shell middens. So American red squirrels also, oh, they also have middens. Oh, okay. It's just, I'll just, okay. Um, and so what they're doing is they are saying, I am a scary thing. I can make really loud noises. I'm very active. I can defend this cache. And so that's why they have these giant, giant middens. And then on the other hand, you have these scatter hoarders that aren't maybe so able to defend um, their caches. Um, so then they rely on the concealment of these small, tiny caches and their low density to protect their caches. So if you've seen these gray squirrels, they'll hide like one nut at a time and they rely on their memory to find them. And so the point I'm trying to make here is that hoarding strategies are really important. It's going to help you survive over a time where there is less food um, and there's different ways that you can handle this kind of situation. Um, so from the plant's perspective, though, it's much more beneficial to be picked up by a scatter hoarder rather than by a larder hoarder, because if you're picked up by a larder hoarder, that seed is going to either go underground where there's no light or you're going to be competing with thousands of other seeds, which isn't a great place for you to germinate. Um, but a scatter hoarder, they might actually be doing something called directed dispersal, where you're bringing the seed far away and putting it in like a very optimal place for germination. Maybe you're sticking it in like a little bit of not moss, so that's like a little bit of hydration, and maybe it's up on a stump where you're farther away from some competing plants. So from the plant's perspective, the scatter hoarder is kind of your best bet um, to get further. But what's really interesting is like, even if we think about gray squirrels and red squirrels, and we're saying we're going to categorize them as this and as that, 
there's actually still a spectrum that exists within animal species. So there are some red squirrels that actually will scatter hoard a little bit and you, well, actually maybe not gray squirrels, that's a bad example, but the many, many other small mammals are going to be on a spectrum. They're going to have large caches in some places that they're gonna defend and then maybe lots of little tiny caches. And so the point here is that like in trying to understand what the relationship is and whether they're going to help and aid in dispersal is we really need to look more because they exist on a spectrum. What are the things that are going to change how they're going to react to a seed? So let's start from the beginning. This is a little bit um, complicated, but it's very easy when I run you through it. What happens when an animal comes upon a seed is that they first have to make many decisions, but their first decision is, am I gonna ignore the seed or am I gonna harvest the seed? If they harvest the seed, are they gonna cache it? Are they gonna store it somewhere else or are they gonna eat it right away? If they decide to cache it, how far away are they going to take it? Where are they gonna take it? And then when are they gonna come back to recover it? So here, each of these decisions are gonna be, are gonna have huge implications on the seed. If you ignore the seed, so it stays close to that parent plant, it can't go very far, it's competing against all these other seeds that the parent plant has made. If you're eaten right away, or if you're recovered, then there's no chance for you to survive, right? So this is not good for your seed. But if you are harvested, cached, and then not recovered, and that's the key here, you're not recovered, then that's very good for the seed. And normally this happens either because the animal forgets where the seed is or they die before they're able to recover it. But this is really the key point here is in this small section of decisions, this is where that strategy for a seed to be taken by an animal is working. Um, so this decision tree, which depicts the seed dispersal process, is really what our lab is really interested in fleshing out. And what you know factors are going to change how an individual is going to take the seed through the process. And so we know that there's lots of extrinsic and intrinsic factors that are going to affect the process. We know that forest structure affects the probability of whether they're going to harvest or ignore the seed. If it's very, very open canopy, it's very risky. So they're less likely to harvest seeds. Uh, we know that luminosity makes a difference. You know, the brighter the moon is, the more likely that there's going to be predators that are active and that can see you. So you're also less likely to select. We know that there's things like the seed density and availability. The more seeds that are available, the richer the resource patch, so the more likely they're gonna be there. We also know that there's lots of intrinsic factors. So what exactly are the traits of the seed? And then what exactly are the traits of the animal itself? And so as you can imagine, each one of these um, factors can yield a lot of different types of, a lot of research just from one. And as computing power is getting better and as technology advances and as more investment is being made, we are getting a little bit of a clearer picture of exactly what the role of a small mammal is in seed dispersal. So where is it that they are on the spectrum? But what I'm here to say is that there is something that's very often overlooked that we think is really important. And hopefully I'll be able to convince you at the end of this presentation that you also think it's something that's important to consider. Um, and that's personality. But what exactly is personality and how can you define it in an animal? We can't give them a pen and paper to tell them to take a Myers-Briggs test. And we also can't invite them to group therapy to talk about their feelings. So how do you prove that a dog is jealous or that a cat is embarrassed? And are we anthropomorphizing them? Are we perhaps wrongfully projecting our own feelings onto them? But I'd argue, and many other people would as well, personality doesn't have to be so complicated. In essence, personality is just consistent behavioral patterns and we can parse it down into just two axes. And so then it's not so hard to imagine that all animals actually have personalities. So on this axis here, you have a high arousal and a low arousal where an animal or a person or whatever it is that you're looking at is going to react very strongly or they're not going to react at all. And then on the second axis, you have a negative or a positive valence. They're gonna react positively 
or they're going to react negatively. And so if we just give an example of a dog meeting a stranger, you know, if it's a golden retriever, where are they going to be? I would guess in the upper right hand corner, they're going to have positive valence and high arousal. Let Yes. Oh my gosh. All the way up there. Um, say it's a dog who has had, um, I couldn't think of a great example because it's really sad, but let's just say they were abandoned and they're scared or they were abused by people before. Maybe they would be more on the top left side. Maybe someone who is a service dog. They are so used to strangers. It's like they're every day. Maybe they're down in the bottom right or maybe the bottom left. But the idea here is that we can already just see very easily without having to ask them any questions, without having them to speak English, we can see that they have personalities. And um, my, my favorite pastime is to find uh, videos of animal personalities. And hopefully this works, but this is two types of dogs. You have the dogs. So you have the dogs that, that love, love the water. The water. And then you have the dogs. And then the dogs. Hey, the <laughs> so it's very obvious here. Hopefully, hopefully, I, I, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hand because I'm just going to assume that I did a great job. Okay. Uh, so personality is consistent behavioral variation across time, across context. If you're a social butterfly, you're going to talk to people at work. You're going to talk to people at the grocery store. You're going to talk to people five years from now. If you're shy, you're going to be the opposite of that. And we know now that personality exists in every single taxa. We found it in worms. We found it in insects. We found it in birds. We found it in fish. It exists every time we try to look for it. We also know that it's heritable. And we also are starting to say, what are the effects of personality? So now we're going to throw that question out, out of the window. We don't really care. We know it's a given. Animals have personality. But what does that mean? And why does it exist? We know that they have effects. They you know, prefer different diets. They prefer different habitats. They prefer to interact with different kinds of things um, and to be active at different kinds of day. But what does that mean? What are the ecological consequences of personality? And so traits like boldness, exploration, activity, aggression, anxiety, these are all things that we're investigating to say, why do they exist? What is the purpose? And what does it mean? especially for the population and for the health of the species. Um, so the important point here is that not all individuals are the same. They differ in all of these different kinds of traits. Personalities are found in all taxa, not by chance. They exist because different individuals are better adapted to different environments. And so from a conservation standpoint, if we're trying to conserve a species, we need to conserve not just genetic variation, but also behavioral variation. So understanding the role of personality can also help us predict how individuals vary in their contribution to ecosystem functions. If we take into account our changing world, this is getting a little heavy, but the impacts of rapid climate change, deforestation, urbanization, some of these things might be affecting portions of the population much more heavily than other portions of the population. So if you think of how personalities are differentially moving or using parts of the habitat, you can think that those parts of the habitat might be degrading faster. And if these certain individuals are the ones that are disproportionately, um, um, I guess, playing those ecosystem functions or those ecological roles, then this might be a problem. So to give uh, you a little bit more of a visual for this, mm -hmm. if the behavioral composition of populations are altered, it may mean that ecosystem services, in this case, seed dispersal that we rely on might dwindle more quickly than we would expect. So for small mammals, some individuals may be more mutualistic, others might be more antagonistic. And as we think about how to conserve these natural systems and maintain a healthy population, we'll need to consider the parts that make up the whole because they're not always equivalent. So now that we've set the stage a little bit for how important this is to look at, I wanted you to finally reap the benefits of coming to this talk and learn about small mammals and find some cute faces here. 
So this on the right here is a juvenile deer mouse. And he's gray because he's a juvenile, but as he gets older, he's gonna get a little bit more brown and a little bit more orange. And what's really cool about them is you can tell the difference uh, from them. So they're sometimes called forest mice because their, their belly is white. And that's very, very different from house mice. And it's um, thought that the reason that they're colored this way is the same way fish are kind of lighter on the bottom on the bottom and darker on the top. If you, cause they're arboreal. If you look at them from the top and they have a whiter belly, they're more likely to not be seen. And then fun trivia. Um, it's thought that this species is what inspired Walt Disney to draw Mickey Mouse. This is a redback vole, Myotes gapperi. Uh, they're very frugivorous, very granivorous, and they're called the red back vole because they have this really beautiful russet brown band from their front down to their back. And this one is drinking a little bit of water from moss. And this guy here is the short-tailed shrew, Blarina brevicata. He is not a granivore, but I wanted to show you this small mammal because he is very, very interesting. He's one of the few venomous mammals in the world, and they actually do caching behavior. They can paralyze their insect prey and cache them alive so that they can eat them later. And there are these like crazy voracious insectivores. If you ever get bitten by one, which I have, I'm very sorry because they'll just paralyze your arm for like a week. They're, they're just crazy. <laughs> So um, I wanted to kind of introduce you to the project that we've been working on and kind of what we've been doing. So for the past, um, I guess, eight years now in central Maine at the Penobscot Experimental Forest, we've been running a really big project to understand small mammal personality and what is happening in the forests um, that they live in. So the Penobscot Experimental Forest is a really cool um, compartmental forest where different um, parts of the forest have been managed differently in terms of logging and silviculture so that researchers can kind of see what are the different um, silviculture practices doing for forest regeneration? How does it change? How does these cutting practices change what is going to happen five or 10 or 20 years from now? And so we work in three different uh, managed units. We work in an even-aged forest where a lot of the trees are the same age and they're actually quite small. It's a very, very dense uh, study site. We also work in a two-stage shelter hood where it's very similar to the even age, but they retain these really big, large trees. And then we also work, which is very rare in Maine, in an unmanaged forest. It hasn't been touched since, I think, the 1800s. And so some of those trees are hundreds of years old. And it's clearly a very, very different landscape from the even age and the two-stage shelter wood. And they're only, you know, a few kilometers apart from each other. So it's the same population, but we're looking at forest structure and how that also affects uh, personality. What kind of personalities live in these different kind of habitats? And like, what are the things that are changing their demographic composition? And so at our study site, um, these are the animals that we trap some of them. And we use two different kinds of traps here. The top one is a tomahawk trap. And the bottom one here is a longworth trap, which my advisor likes to call the Cadillac of small mammal traps. It's really cool. So there's two different compartments. There's this compartment here, which is the trapping mechanism. But then here, this is the housing compartment. And you can see that it's angled upward so that even when it rains, they're not going to get wet which is really great. And in here, you can put bedding, you can put all kinds of food stuff in here. We like to say this is the best meal that they're ever gonna get in their life. Mm -hmm. We put sunflower seeds and peanut butter and oats in there so they get carbs, protein, all, all the things that they want. Um, so these are the ways that we trap them. And you're already familiar with these top three species, but we also catch red squirrels, chipmunks, and we also get shrews I don't know if you've ever seen them, but some of these shrews are only three grams large. So just three paper clips. They're so small. And I think my, one of my favorite papers, one of my favorite scientific papers is about these guys because they have to eat every four hours or they're going to die. They live on this like crazy metabolic tightrope 
where since they're so small and so active, they need to eat so frequently. Um, and I just can't imagine how something like that can survive like and exist. That's just insane to me. Um, but yes, so that is how we trap our animals. Once we get them, uh, we run them through a couple of different things. First, we take lots of data from them. Of course, this is how they pay their rent from when they came into the trap. So we take their weight, their sex, their stage of reproduction, and then we give them little microchips, just like the same that um, your dog or your cat gets from your vets. So we can scan them and we know exactly who that individual is. But just in case that doesn't work, we also give them unique ear tags and we also give them little haircuts so that we can visually identify, yes, this is individual A. Um, and so these are all the kinds of things that we're doing out in the field after we trap them. Um, now that we've captured our animals, how do we measure their personality? So here um, I've showed two different tests that we run, and these are quite popular in the animal personality world. So this first one is called the emergence test. We've put an animal into a clean trap, so we assume that this is a relatively safe space for them. And then we wait and time how long it takes for them to come out. And you can imagine this is actually really scary because they were literally lifted up into the air, placed into some strange box, and then you're going to expect them to come out, especially after, you know, there's, I'm opening the door, you know, like they're going to come out. Some of them never come out. Some of them shoot out while your hand is still on the door. So even that is just such a crazy difference in behavior and personality that you see that some are just so much more risk averse. Some of them just don't care. They're just going to go for it. Um, and then the second test we run is a open field test. And it's called an open field test because it's an open field. Um, it's used in a lot of pharma pharmacological studies, but we built our own and we put it out into the field and put our mice into it. And the idea here is to measure traits such as exploration behavior, activity, we see how far they run, how fast they run, how much they're trying to jump up on the side of the board here. And so here's an example of a mouse. This is the deer mouse, this is an adult. He's grooming here now. That's also a personality variable that we take. That's kind of a stress variable. He's rearing up on the sides here. We kind of interpret this as exploration. And what's really interesting here is you can see he's kind of sticking to the sides of the box because that's safer. They have one protected side, but every so often he'll cross into the middle. And that is something that we interpret as boldness. You're more protected on the side of the box. So when you cross through the center, that's a risk-taking personality behavior. And so this is kind of to give you an idea of what the foundational data set that we are working with is. We're describing what animals live in our study sites and what and who are they. And so I just wanted to introduce you really quickly. I won't read all of this, but um, basically this is our team and these are the kinds of questions that we're asking. Uh, one of the most recent studies that has been done was Bridget Humphreys, who looked at pilfering behavior and personality. So do certain kinds of personalities steal more? Are they more likely to steal from other people's caches? And she did find a result. Uh, Maisie Mers, who is supposed to be here today, but hopefully I'm filling in her shoes a little bit. She right now is working on a foraging pattern experiment where she's putting out seeds and trying to see are there different kinds of personalities that are more efficient foragers. Uh, Alison Brem, who's been really pivotal in uh, the, I guess the start of this project, she was the first uh, graduate student on this project, has looked at a lot of things. She has proven many of them, which I'll get into a little bit later, just so that you guys can see some results. Uh, but these are the kinds of questions that we're asking. Um, I don't think I have very much time left, or I just wanted to see before I get too far into this. <laughs> no, I'm okay? Okay. All right. Um, but this is my seed experiment. And since I'm here, you're going to listen to my seed experiment. <laughs> um, so one of the coolest questions, I think, is trying to understand how personality is going to play out in the face of climate change. So right now, well, I guess we're not in central Maine, but central Maine at the very top, at the middle there is at the northern range limit of 64 different plant species. And so as climate change happens, 
this range that these species are able to live in, this is called the habitable range, is going to shift. It's going to shift northwards. It's going to shift to higher elevations. But seeds that are very large, so hickories, oaks, they're going to need animals to move them. And if they don't move them, then these 64 species might go extinct. And so this is kind of the question that I'm looking at is as these seeds start to move up north and meet populations that have never seen these seeds before, are there going to be certain personalities that are more likely to disperse these new seeds that they've never seen before? So I would guess that it's the ones that are less scared of new things, maybe the ones that are more exploratory that are gonna pick up these seeds and move them. And so what's important about this study is that, well, I think I've already said it, but it's really important. <laughs> I, I think what I'm trying to get at is what are the things that we really need to look at for our populations to predict whether these species are going to continue to exist? Because we can say, yeah, there's squirrels. Yes, there's mice. Of course, these seeds are going to, are going to move up, but it's going to be that velocity. If that habitable range is moving faster than the individuals are picking them up and learning them, then maybe it's those front runners, those ones at the very, very front that say, yes, I can use that seed. That's something I can use that are going to change the, I guess, the trajectory of whether that plant is going to survive or not. Oh, animation, more animations. Okay, so this is my setup. Um, I put out a motion triggered camera on a bunch of seeds that I picked. Oh, I did not introduce you to them. Yeah, I use lots of different acorns here. And they're, uh, let's see, we know rubra is, and macrocarpa, they're both found in Maine, so they're native seeds. But these four here are one of the 64 species that are at the northern range limit, expecting to move north. And so these are the seeds that I'm putting out. I put them underneath the camera so that I can see exactly what are the mice and voles and squirrels doing with the seeds. Which ones are they interacting with? Which ones are they selecting? And then I put an RFID reader antenna around it so that I can read that microchip. I know what their personality is when they come up to this seed. I also paint the seeds and then dust fluorescent powder around the board so that once that seed is taken out of the frame of the camera, I can still track and find exactly what happened to that seed. I know how far away it went. I know what kind of habitat it was cached in. And if I put another camera on that seed, then I know how long it took them to recover that seed. So this is the meat of the project here. This is how we collect the data. Oh yeah. Oh, the color. Yes. It doesn't. I did a, a separate experiment where I put mm, like nothing in the middle and they still came to get the seeds. So there was no difference in the number of visits between whether it was painted and whether it was powdered. Um, but yeah, it's a great question because it's so bright. You would think like, oh my gosh, how could they possibly decide to come? So I actually have to run these experiments at night because I can't track fluorescent things during the day. So they actually I mean, I'm assuming they can't see these colors at night, but maybe, I guess, no, it's not. The, yeah, yes, it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so these are kinds of uh, what it looks like when you go out at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning and you're trying to find these tiny little mouse footprints and follow them to their little treasure chests. So on the left here is a crazy network of what was a flying squirrel that came to the station and took every single seed and then in like a web had stashed one seed under a pile of leaves like every six like there's 16 seeds on the tray and each one of those was cached exactly the same way this in the middle here is i believe a three acorn cache so you can see that it's already different there some of them are putting them together some of them aren't and then this is a video of what it looks like to actually track um, uh, a trail. This one is a pretty um, impressive trail. It's very significant, which makes me feel that this individual has been coming back and forth on the same trail from their burrow back to the seed tray station. And then here, this is their burrow. I've marked it here. There was a seed there. 
And then they've also cached, I don't know if you saw it. I didn't pause it. <laughs> pause it quick enough, but there was also another seed cached right near the mouth of their burrow. So those are already two different, very micro, very different microhabitats that they're caching these seeds in. Um, so here's some videos of what mice do with their seeds. This one is what I call a window shopper. He's like, can't really decide. I don't know if I really need it. I had one monthly. <laughs> And so he's tasting them all before he decides that, you know what, maybe I will take this one. Yeah, and so what's really impressive is that these acorns can be six grams large, whereas a mouse could be maybe 25 grams large. So it's 25% of their weight, it's very heavy. It is scary to be a tiny mouse that everything in the world wants to eat. You're just like this tiny meatball in the environment and you're going to grab this thing and like lift up your head and move around with it. That's scary. So that's already something that I am so impressed with. Um, this one is, I guess, let's see. I don't know what I would call this one. Let's see. Maybe the researcher. I'd call this the researcher. It's like, this can't decide, but then they do. And then this one is that one rare individual that walks to the back of the aisle of the shop of the supermarket, grabs milk, and then that's it. So they know what they want, much less picky. And then this um, is that short-tailed blurina, the short-tailed shrew. They are not granivores, but for some reason, I got a video of one of them trying to grab a seed. And you can see that it is not easy for him. He just like cannot get it. He doesn't have the teeth. I don't know why he's here, but it's already just so cool how quickly some of them can pick them up. But he can see he wants it. He just can't get it. Yeah, and then he gives up. So I'm sure as you can imagine, um, Doing field work can sometimes be a little bit messy and things happen that you don't expect and things come to your seed stations that you also don't expect. <laughs> so those are the footprints of this animal that came to my station. Okay. Yes, just loves them. <laughs> it's pig mouse. And oh, he's coming back for more. Yeah, I wish there was some sound on this video because you can hear very satisfying crunches happening, but very cute. Another guy I had to contend with and fight with, you can see I tried to put a cage around my stations at one point, but these guys were way too smart for me. And I just, in the end, I could never, I could never win over them. This is a raccoon. So I built this cage where the opening is like this large and they are still able to stick their whole arm in there and then they just you know, they dump the whole thing over. Yeah, it's very smart. Um, so I I wanted to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly through the, the results and then we can spend more time on these if you actually have questions about them. But so we know that the lower your anxiety, the more the farther away you're going to take your seed. Like this has been proven. This is what we have seen. We also know that there's a big variation in mice on that spectrum of mutualistic to antagonistic. And these are uh, summed up mm, scores over the entire season. So a mouse comes, comes, comes. We score every single one of their interactions. And then this is an average. So on average, this individual is always mutualistic. That individual is always antagonistic. So we can see there's a huge variation. Now let's add personality onto there. And we can see that ones that are more timid are going to be more antagonistic. And so the ones that are less timid are the ones that are more likely to aid this seed in dispersal. So if we're thinking again back into our behavioral composition, if you know the ones that are less timid are the ones that are living in habitats that we're degrading more, 
then we're not going to see as many mutualistic interactions as we would expect. So hopefully having gone over these results and all of these things, I have convinced you that small mammals are vital for forests. Personality affects decisions at these key stages of the seed dispersal process. And that if we're going to conserve a population, if we're going to conserve a species, if we're going to conserve an ecosystem, we can't only just be thinking about biological diversity or genetic diversity, but we also need to be thinking about behavioral diversity. And before I end, um, I want to thank everyone, of course, um, my uh, advisor, Alessio Moraliti, all the graduate students in my lab, the many, many field technicians and volunteers that come out to help with this study, as well as our funding sources. And then lastly, oh, what happens? <laughs> Don't know where that came from. I just created this beautiful clip of a camera that I had put onto a 14.8 acorn stash that this mouse made. And so I put it up for like a month. So you'll be able to see what is happening. So this is November 11th, 2021. And this guy has come back to his stash to check out what's going out, going on. So it's raining and he's come back. The stash is right in the middle. He's covering it with leaves. And now it's the 28th, it's the first frost. That's one acorn he's gonna take. The same night, he's gonna take another one. And then the day after, and there's nothing left in the cache anymore. Hold on, hold on. Oh. Yeah, so that's it. <laughs> I know. Are there any questions? Uh, Ooh. Hmm. So right now I'm analyzing the data from this one and I am finding that there is a personality variable, which is latency to emerge. It's that, do you remember the emergence test and them coming out of the box? The ones that took longer to come out of the box, this is also very preliminary. So don't repeat this outside of this. It hasn't been double checked yet by reviewers or anybody. But what I'm finding is the ones that are taking longer to come out of the box are less likely to take any acorn at all. Like all, all they're just less likely to take all of them. It's just scary. They're heavy acorns, except for the two native species. So they're more familiar with them, I think, and they're more likely to take a risk on those acorns. So that's something I'm finding now. Um, but yeah, it's exciting. I'm writing it up as we speak. So hopefully I can send it to everybody soon. But after this, I'm really interested in uh, competition. So intraspecific, interspecific competition. Because what I'm interested in is personality must not just be something that exists relative to your own population, right? We know that there are different personalities that choose to live in different kinds of communities of small mammals. So there are bold ones that are, let's see, bold mice are more likely to overlap the territory of American red squirrels. So then what I'm thinking is, what is all, how, like, how does that all come together? 
I don't know. I haven't fleshed this out very much, clearly. But that's something I'm interested in, is how does competition come all into this personality kind of thing? Oh, do you want to follow up? No, I have a question about oh. uh, predators on the mice. Like, yes. In some of your study areas, do you have resident owls, for example? We, I don't believe we have resident resident owls. I have seen owls in our places before. And what's really interesting is we tried to do a predation study before. And owls are just so scary to all of them that there kind of isn't any variation in how they in how they react to them. This, as soon as you play owl call, all of them like react the same way. It's just so scary. But we Maisie actually just did a study on predators. She looked at coyotes and bobcats and weasels and fishers and what else is there? I think those are the raccoons. Those are the main ones. And she looked at the density of these predators in our sites to see if it related to personality at all. And it did, which is really interesting. The ones that are more bold are more likely to be, you know, active and live in those kinds of environments rather than the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see any like some of the some Ooh, that's an interesting question. I, I would guess there probably is maybe not. It's something that not a lot of people actually look into. I think, I don't know, American culture I don't, I've been told that American culture and research were like very focused on competition. Like we love that, like good guy, bad guy kind of thing. Um, so not a lot of symbiosis research is happening, but I can imagine a lot of those things are probably like not on purpose. Like if um, um, someone, let's say, I don't know, what is the first species that might, I don't know, let's say a raccoon is the first one to come to that station. Maybe if it's a time of acorn fall, you know, some kind of species is following the scent of the raccoon to find these like rich resource patches. And so they're using cues and maybe there's symbiosis there. I'm not sure. But yeah, we do know that within hmm, within species, they cooperate, especially for the winter, because small mammals are so small they actually have to huddle together in the winter in order to, to survive. So American red squirrels, actually, they huddle together in the winter, which is surprising because you can't imagine that they would do that. But they've actually proven that there's like a hormonal change in their body that allows them to be less aggressive and able to socialize with each other. And so they have to, which is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. What's the lifespan of some of these people? Yeah, some of them are very small. So a mouse probably lives one year, I would say. Um, a red squirrel probably lives three or four years. So they're very, very small. Uh, yeah, they don't have a lot of time to live. The longest lived, yeah, is probably the gray squirrel, I would I would estimate. That's another question. Yeah. Do you find a pattern between generations? Like if you have a old... Um, a brazen creature is the next generation going to be like that? Yeah, so we know that personality is heritable, so it is more likely that their offspring will be whatever it is that it is. Um, but that's a really interesting question because we're trying to look at how it changes, like how the composition of behavior changes over time. Like, does it remain consistent or does it shift? And if it shifts, why is it shifting? Um, we we'll, we have eight years of data. So that's something that we're really interested in looking at. So that's a great question. Yeah. You mentioned that one of the, one of the reasons personality is important is to understand how human structures on the environment might affect different mammals. Yeah. Like in different areas because of their personality. Mm -hmm, Can you mm -hmm. describe like what kind of needs to have certain kind of personality? Ooh, yes. Let's, uh, what kind of, oh, sorry, could you repeat the last part? I'm just wondering if like, you could give an example of a specific ecosystem where a personality would be exhibited, uh, like a boldness personality mm. would be exhibited rather than yeah, let's see. I'm going to try to think of the best personality example I can think of. Let's see. 
for how, oh, okay well i mean i guess i can use the same i guess the same species here so we've done a microhabitat study on these guys where different personalities prefer different kinds of microhabitats i don't remember the specifics but i would hazard to say that it was bold ones that are more likely to live in open canopy rather than enclosed canopy so silviculture you know maine does a ton of logging if we are logging so much that there's only one kind of microhabitat available, that they're all open and they're not closed, you're only going to have those bold individuals, then where do the shy ones go to live? So that's kind of the idea is like there needs to be a balance of these, like when we're managing a forest for for timber or for whatever it is, like how are we going to manage it so that there is diff a different diverse a diversity of habitats within there so that a diversity of individuals can live in there does that does that answer your question okay yeah yes have you looked at like in, in like mating of the animals and whether there's kind of a preference like hold you know, Ooh, and, that would be in, like sexual selection uh, yes yeah. yes do opposites attract or not this would be a really great study i yeah i haven't looked at that but that would be really interesting to see uh i i will pose this to my lab mates and see if anyone <laughs> wants to take this <laughs> well thank you so much cool And thanks for joining us tonight and check out our Zoom only program for next month. And hopefully we'll see you then. Yes, and questions? Yes, this is, has been recorded and will be posted. So if you wanna take another look, it will be there or share it with someone else. So thank you very much and good night.